Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you all out here. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to those on the live stream as well. We are worshiping uh, together, whether in person or across the miles. I was just talking with someone yesterday who um, mentioned that she had wanted to go to church and uh, was not going to be able to go to church, but then called up a friend of hers, and uh, they went to church together by each from their own homes virtually watching this service. And so for them, that was able, for, they were able to go to church and then chatted in the comments and, and so forth. So um, wherever we are, we want to worship God authentically and with our spirits and open ourselves. Today, we have Muncie Jenkins, who will be uh, our guest singer today for a song in the beginning, then towards the end, we'll be singing a hymn. We'll be preaching today from the Gospel of John. I know we've been in Mark for a while, and we're going to detour in the Gospel of John for a few weeks, and then jump back into Mark um, for all the way through Thanksgiving. So um, we'll complete our our study there. And so today we're going to talk about two stories that you may have heard before, where Jesus feeds the 5,000 and where Jesus walks on water. And so we're going to um, hear that, and you'll hear that scripture twice. Hannah will read it to you, and then I'll read it again before we um, get into the message. So we want to encourage you during this last week to bring in the items that we are collecting for Canal Winchester Human Services, for school supplies, and so there's an insert in your bulletin. There's also that listing on um, our Facebook page, and so... You can bring your supplies in um, this week or through next Sunday as well. So that's uh, the school supplies. And then also, next Sunday is going to be a very special worship service where we are calling it Cancer Sunday. So it is going to be a service where we are praying for all those who are currently dealing with cancer, going through treatments for cancer and remission of cancer, we're going to have a special time to remember those who are already gone on into the resurrection uh, because of cancer. And then we're also going to be praying for those families and friends who are helping um, support those who are going through cancer. So there is a, it, it's going to be a very special service. Uh, we're going to be kind of moving around during that service, special prayer times, and encourage you to uh, invite others that you know maybe are dealing, battling with cancer now, and we're going to have a chance for you to uh, hang ribbons and write names down and so forth. So uh, it's Cancer Sunday. We're going to do the, we're going to uh, kind of go through the same process at both services. Uh, so I encourage you to bring somebody or at least be ready yourself if you're dealing with cancer or uh, you've lost somebody with cancer. Um, or you're supporting a family member with cancer. Be at this service, and uh, we as a church family, community of faith, are going to come together and pray and just focus on that issue. So, my friends, uh, let's have a moment of prayer, and then Muncie will lead us off in worship. Jesus, you are the Savior of the world, our Redeemer, and so today, on this day, we come to you just as we are, we kneel before you, we humble ourselves, we open our hearts, and we let your loving word uh, begin to transform us. So we seek you. And so, Lord, fill this place, fill our homes. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So, like Pastor John introduced earlier, our scripture reading today comes from the book of John, and it's two stories. The first story is the feeding of the 5,000, and that's actually in all four Gospels. And then the second story is Jesus walks on the water. It's a bit longer of a scripture, so I invite you to listen and just see what God reveals to you. After this, Jesus went to the other side of, the, of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him, because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the Passover, the festival of the Jews, Jesus was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him 
for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in this place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he gave thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves, Left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became, became rough because of a strong wind and was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they walked to him. They wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May the Lord bless this reading. All right, my friends, if you have your Bibles out at home, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, or uh, we probably have it on the screens here, but I also encourage you to take out the Bibles in the pews, and you can write in them, mark them up, whatever um, you need to do. Interestingly, uh, I was, went to visit Jim Bragg about a week I've seen him a couple times. It was a couple of weeks ago when I went and visited him. Um, in this one particular time, um, we were going to read scripture. And I had my Bible on my phone, but I said, do you have a Bible I can look at? And so he got out his Bible. And um, I have never seen a Bible so highlighted in my life. <laughs> I mean, it's easier probably to have looked at words and passages that weren't highlighted. And... Uh, stuff written everywhere and in the back um, and just that's what Bibles are for write them up write in them use them okay so we're in the Gospel of John we have four Gospels in the Bible right Matthew Mark Luke and John the synoptics are actually Matthew Mark and Luke John uh, though considered a gospel um, is has a little bit different approach and so, like I said, we're going to be in the Gospel of John for a few weeks and then go back into Mark. Now, this story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, or sometimes it's called the multiplication of loaves, um, is in all four Gospels. So clearly, it is central to the meaning of who Jesus is, of how Jesus is revealing what God is doing in the world. And then we have where Jesus walks on um, the water in the storm. Now, these stories are both very Jesus-centric. And I want you to listen to them because there's sort of a transition between the two. And the transition is where Jesus flees or leaves the crowd and goes off to the mountain beside by himself. Um, because he sees that the crowd is a little misguided. And then he meets up with the disciples on, on the sea. I also want you to see in the story as we're hearing it that there's several basic human um, qualities or, or factors that, that come into play here. There's hunger and there's fear, right? We've all been hungry. Some of us have been starving some of us have been you know literally wondering based on food insecurities um and then there's this this hunger we have for jesus to 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 fill us 
And then there's fear. We've all had fear, fear of different things. And so we see in what Jesus is doing here um, how he is the creator, the savior, the redeemer of the earth. Now, when we hear these stories, it's also important to understand that where we can hear these words literally, and they certainly paint a picture, John writes in such a way that we are to see past these signs to a deeper element of faith, of what is happening here, of what, about, of what is being conveyed, okay? So in other words, don't get too hung up on, well, how did he feed 5,000 people with five loaves, right? There's, there's something more important the gospel writer is helping us understand. All right, so verse, 20, verse 1, chapter 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. And so the signs point to, um, signs are something in the Bible that reveal the divinity um, of, of the person. So we even see with prophets where they have signs that they do. But Jesus is healing the sick. There's this teaching. And so Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with the disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews was near. So we know the Passover is a celebration of remembering the exodus from Egypt, correct? And this leads us to what the early church celebrated as communion and what we celebrate as communion today. So when Jesus looked up, he saw a large crowd coming toward him. So this crowd continues to follow him. And Jesus says to Philip, one of the disciples, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? So the disciples are asking Jesus. And he said to this to test him. So he is putting the ownership, the responsibility back on the disciples, back on us. For he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, six months wages. So the basic laborer earning 200 denarii would not have been able to afford to, to feed all these with even six months of wages. Would not be enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, so we had have another disciple, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? So he said, hey, there's a kid who has a lunch. I mean, what's a kid's lunch going to do with over five, to feed 5,000 people, right? And barley loaves, barley was really sort of like the poor man's bread. It's what was the common, most common for people to, to eat, sort of the most commonly available. And then the fish, what would be the word used here in, in the original Greek, would, would relate to like dried fish, not even a fancy can of sardines or a nice salmon, you know, grilled on a cedar plank, right? This is like, but what we get at here is that Jesus, in, in the scripture is, you know, Jesus provides the sustenance for what we need, the basics. It's, there's some realism here. So we have this great, Christology, divinity, Jesus the savior of the world, dealing with a basic kid's common lunch and how that's gonna feed everybody, provide for everybody. Verse 10, Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now when he says make the people sit down, the, the word here, the verb here is to recline. So they were going to recline as the rich people do to eat. This is how Jesus is going to feed them. Recline, to lay back. And Jesus is going to serve them. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. I'm going to say that again. There was a great deal of grass in the place. Does that ring a bell? A scripture, a psalm. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What psalm is that? It's the 23rd Psalm. Jesus makes him sit down in the green grass. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. 
And so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Jesus distributes. It's not like, hey, gives them to the disciples and you go out. So what we have here is really an early foreshadowing of the, of the Passover meal, what we know is the Eucharist of, the, of, of communion, where Jesus blesses and gives the bread and the fish and he gives it to all the people there. Imagine yourself receiving this from the hands of Jesus. You're coming up and receiving as much as you want, not like, hey, there's a bunch of people in line behind you, so only take one scoop. Like, you know, when you go through the church buffets and everybody just loads up, like this is what Jesus would say. Not only load up your plate, grab a second plate. I would be like, hey, there's a bunch of people behind you. Let's all just take a little bit the first time through, right? But Jesus is like, no, you take as much as you want. When they were satisfied... He told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. And so gathered them up from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, and they filled 12 baskets. So we have the 12 baskets. There's enough left over for the 12 tribes of Israel for all the people in the world for the great eschatological banquet that is going to happen. After they had eaten, they gathered this up. And Jesus said, so that nothing may be lost, so that no one may be lost. I, Jesus, am coming for everybody. And also, as we believe in the economy of God, I believe that nothing is ever wasted. That God can take what we have and keeps being used in creation. So, when the people saw the sign that he had done, this miracle... They began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, John writes in a particular way to help us see that Jesus is among the great prophets of Israel's past, but more. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So Jesus saw... And this is important to know, right? Because the people looked at him like, hey, this guy is healing people. He's teaching us. He just did all this feeding. He's, he needs to be our king. We like what he does. He's better than the Romans. Let's make him leader overall. He's our guy. And so we're going to get what we want at the expense of them over there. Let's make him our king. And do you, do you get this? Like, we do this today in politics, right? Hey, that's our person. Let's get them elected. We as humans, we're continually misguided. But Jesus knows this is not what he is about. And he, this, he's not come to be the king that we want him to be. If Jesus becomes the king that, that we want, that we can define, that if we can define this God, then it's, it's not really God. So Jesus flees, withdraws. The NRSV we read says withdraws, but he really, the word is fled. He got out of there to the mountain to be by himself. So now we have this, so that was kind of our transition. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. In other words, they're like, hey, Jesus is not around here anymore, so we might as well get going. So they get into the boat. They started crying. To, across the sea to Capernaum, and it was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. Now, what are the disciples afraid of? The storm or Jesus? Jesus. Now, it's not a trick question. At first, we might think, well, they're afraid because they're in the storm. And, and some of the other stories in, in the other gospels talk about how they're afraid of the storm. And John, here, they're afraid of Jesus. They see Jesus. But this is what we call in the Bible a theophany. It's called a, a human experience with a divine person. And just like when angels or, or, or messengers from God or Jesus shows up, they always have to say to the human, don't be afraid, fear not. They see Jesus coming in, in this they are, it's a natural human reaction to something so divine. And they're, they're, they're afraid of this. But Jesus said to them, it is I, or more accurately, I am. So he reflects the I am. And of course, we know later on there's six or seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the shepherd. 
I am. Do not be afraid. And they wanted, then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. So we hear in the scripture, and I just keep thinking, okay, in today's life, what is it that we are hungry for? What is it that Jesus provides for? And in this fear that we have in our life, what does our faith come in here? And so the title of today's message is How to Feed Our Faith. When we were, when I last spoke with you a few weeks ago, we talked about how we might deepen our faith. So now it's how we might feed our faith. Uh, Kind of an interesting side comment. When I was working on the bulletin and talking on the phone with Becky, she thought I said face and wrote in the bulletin how to feed your face. (laughs) I'm like, well, we are talking about feeding and this and that. So we were able to make that correction before the bulletin went to print. But... So how do we feed our faith? What is it that we do in this situation that allows our faith, and again, I'm not talking about a faith that just sees everything as miraculously becoming better, but a faith that in these times of wondering how you're going to find food, how you're wondering wondering about finding something you need in life, or when you're fearful of events around you, how your faith is there. You know, and this is, it's, it's important to understand this because as we are approaching Cancer Sunday, people that are dealing with cancer, people who have died with cancer, in all these situations, um, you know, because there's times where I think, well, God, why can't you save that person? Why can't that person be healed? Why can't this just be better? And then I remember that, well, we're all going to die. So how is it that we live and find life in Christ? How do we live that life? And how does our faith remind us of how we stay connected with the one who truly loves us? Because when we know whose we are, we know who we are. So a few weeks ago, we talked about how do we approach living and deepening our faith. And I said we have to be grounded in and understanding what God has done in Jesus. That personally, we have to have a life of prayer, that we have to put our faith into action, and this requires some self-discipline on our part of reading, of journaling, of praying, of, of, of whatever disciplines you might have, but it takes your sort of conscious effort to, um, I'm going to keep coming back, I'm going to keep leaning into, I'm going to keep reading, I'm going to keep trusting, even if when I don't feel it, even when I don't understand it. Because I know, and what you know, but what we forget is that this God through Jesus has never left us. It may seem like that. And so when all else fails, we go back to answer number one. It's what Jesus has done for us. You know, we talked about how we preach Christ crucified, us being willing to humble ourselves and see that what we do, what we know, comes through what we have received through Jesus Christ. And so some items to think about today is signs. How do we misread signs? How do we misread what is happening around us? Just like the people did there, right? They looked and like, hey, this, this is the one, this is, this is who's supposed to be our king. And they wanted to take Jesus for own human worldly purposes. How are we misreading signs today? And then what um, Philip did, right? He's the one who looked at the the five loaves and said, you know, what good is this going to do? What are they among so many people? He's calculating the impossibility. And this is part of our faith. This is part of the ministry or ecclesiology, the, the, how the church functions and how the church works. Because sometimes we calculate the impossibility. Like, you know what? There is no way this can happen or should happen. And then it happens. We calculate the impossibility. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough this. And we do this in our own lives, right? And sometimes it's why we don't act on our faith or follow where God's leading us because we calculate the impossibility and like it's so meager, See, this story of the feeding of 5,000 also 
harkens back to the stories. Remember Elisha and Elijah back in the Old Testament? So there are these two great prophets, and you can read about them in 2 Kings. Well, Elisha feeds 100 people with 20 barley loaves. And even Elisha's servants like, hey, we only have 20 barley loaves. There's no way we're going to feed 100 people. But it happens. See how the Bible, the scripture, has put in there our words. Hey, what are, what are five loaves among so many people? Like, what can I do? I think sometimes this comes into how we live out our life. Like, well, what's it really matter? Does it matter if I help here, if I volunteer here, or help fold tables, or help put the chairs away, or help paint this, or do this for that person, or give money here to this charity, or give this? Does it really matter? See, God takes what little or what you see as meager and makes things happen beyond our calculations and possibilities. And I also like the questions that are asked. I've always been a big proponent of asking questions, asking God questions, asking questions in your prayer. The disciples ask questions like, I don't know, how's this gonna work? And then two, looking at knowing what we're afraid of. This one gets tough. What are we afraid of? Because the disciples in the boat were afraid of, of Jesus because they couldn't understand how this was happening. But we have to know what we're afraid of. They wanted Jesus to do something for them, and I think we can get, again, misguided. Like sometimes we want Jesus to take away our fear, take away the scare, take away the, the, the hunger, we want what Jesus does for us sometimes more than we want Jesus, right? Let me make a little analogy. Have you ever done something for your kids or your grandkids? Right, you got them a toy. Like You like giving them a toy or you like making them a nice meal and they like having it. But what do you really want? You want that relationship and connection with your, the kid the grandkid, right? And you want them to love you, not the toy. Do we love this Jesus? And loving Jesus, what that means then is we have this faith that gets us through these tough times. We have this faith that allows us to see the beauty of, of God in, in each day. As we talk here about this feeding, it also goes back, this passage will look at what happens um, in the wilderness. What did God provide in the wilderness on a daily basis to the Israelites? Yeah, what was it called? Manna. So there's this manna that was provided. Now, what do we say in the Lord's Prayer? Give us our daily bread. How long did the manna last? One day. What happens if you tried to collect a whole bunch of manna and save it, put it in the Tupperware? It went bad, right? Rotted. You trust in the provision of God. And so Deuteronomy also talks, he, in Deuteronomy 8.3, says that God humbled you by letting you hunger and then by feeding you with manna with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So God knows what we need, but we also don't live by this bread, this food, this sustenance alone, but by what God provides to us, what Jesus speaks to us. John 6, 31 through 33 says, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
And they said to him, sure, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we look at our faith. We see the signs that are happening. How do we feed our faith? What is it that you do? What is it that you're not doing? The spiritual material care of God's flock is something miraculous that only God can do. In a moment, we're going to have communion. So remember back to this time where Jesus was there breaking the bread and handing it out to everyone. Today, that's what we'll celebrate. That's what we'll receive, this bread. So as you receive communion today, and you take that piece, I want you to think to yourself, what is it, what was it maybe this past week that I was hesitant to give or to do because I thought it was too meager. I thought it wasn't enough. I thought it wouldn't matter. Or maybe you were afraid of what somebody may have said to you or done. And don't guilt yourself, but see that as a way that you can put your faith into action, feed your faith, trust in the Lord, and that next opportunity, you can respond in the way that Christ is leading you. Amen? Amen.